Well, good morning, everyone. It is a great joy um, to be here. Thanks to Phil for um, giving me the opportunity to uh, preach the word today. Thanks for the elders for uh, granting me this privilege. It's, it's a true honor. It's a true grace for me to um, open up the word and, and share with you uh, what the Lord has taught me um, through, through his word. So before we start, let's bow our head and ask God's blessing um, on this time. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that we can um, be together as a church family, grateful that we can uh, worship you, uh, this amazing, great God who uh, stepped in into our sin to save us and rescue us. Thanks for uh, sending your son to die on the cross for us. I pray that um, you may open the eyes and the hearts of all those who are here to be receptive to your word, that you may guide my mouth as I speak, that I may give you honor and glory as I explain this wonderful story about your amazing grace that saves sinners. I ask your blessing on this time in the name of your son, Jesus, amen. And when you read history, you realize that history often give us fascinating stories about, about men and women who can often inspire our life and, and motivate us to, to give our best to do, to kind of raise up a notch our lives. But other times, as you read history, you also face yourself with some individuals that are not that that good, that instead of being heroes, instead of being famous for their, their good qualities, for their great character, they're famous for their wretchedness. And, and one of this is definitely John Newton. Um, if you're not familiar with his life, his story, John Newton was born in 1725 in a small town in London. And uh, he was the son of a captain of the Britain Royal Fleet. Um, when he was young, only six years old, he lost his mom, and so he grew up basically without parents. His dad was always on the sea, and he was without mom. And, and growing up without parents didn't end up well for him. Uh, by the time he was 17, he traveled extensively. He had already crossed the ocean six times. When he turned 18, he was forced to join the Britain Royal Fleet. Navy, but, but he was an insubordinate guy, uh, insubordinate man. He, he was rebellious, he did not listen to order, and he was that bad that at one point, his crew, his captain, couldn't stand him anymore, and they abandoned him in Africa, um, all by himself. He was imprisoned by a tribe in Africa, he was enslaved, he was tortured, he was he basically lost all his humanity until one day uh, a Britain ship uh, stopped by that region in Africa and the captain of the ship was a good friend with John Newton's dad. And so they rescued him, they brought him back. And by that time, Newton's heart was, was hardened. And he was hard, hard. He became a drunkard, he became a violent man, uh, full of anger. Uh, he became a costume to swear God for every, every reason. Um, and at this point in this life, he, he was a depraved man that was destined to hell. And only one thing, only one thing could change his life. The God, the grace of God, the transforming, irresistible grace of God. And so one day as he was crossing the ocean, he was sleeping on his bed in the, in the ship, and the ship was surrounded by a storm. And, and he woke up with the water that was raising up to the level of his bed, and he was about to die. And in a cry of desperation, he said, God, God, save us all. And, and after many hours, the storm stopped. He arrived to dry land. And first things that he did when he arrived there, he opened his Bible. He found a Bible, he opened it up, he started reading it, and he continued in his wretched life for many years, for five more years. 
He was involved in the trafficking of slaves from Africa to the United States, and, and it, it was just awful, awful. He did awful things. But those three years, uh, God started working in his heart, and he finally changed him. And after five years of trafficking slaves, he stopped doing that, and he devoted himself to the preaching of the gospel. And this is an amazing story of how God, grace, changes life. And today, I want to ask you to open your Bible in Genesis 38. This is the chapter that we will study, we will read, and, and, and exposit today. And this is a story about a man that, if possible, is even worse than, than John Newton. A man who was completely depraved, a man that was lost in a sin, that had no interest in God at all. And we will see how God's redemptive grace transformed his life. And so, as you, as you turn your Bible to Genesis 38, I want to give you a warning. This is not the usual Old Testament stories that you read about this good character that you want to follow in his step and set up a real good model of trust in God. This is not what we're going to read about. This is going to be a man who did some horrible, terrible things. Uh, but this is a story of how God, how God's grace can reach out into the depth of our sinfulness and rescue everyone who trusts in him. So today, in this passage, in Genesis 38, we will see three truths about sin and God's infinite grace. Three truths about sin and God's infinite grace. Let me read you the first 11 verses. This is what the Bible says. And it came about at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adulamite, whose name was Ira. Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her and went into her. So she conceived and bore a son, and he named him Er. Then she conceived again and bore a son and named him Onan. She bore still another son and named him Shelah, and he was at Kebitz, Kedzib, that she bore him. Now Judah took a wife for her, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But her, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of Yahweh. So Yahweh took his life. And then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and perform your duty as a brother-in-law to her, and raise up offspring for your brother. But Anna knew that the offspring would not be his. So when he went into his brother's wife, he wasted his seed on the ground in order not to give offspring to his brother. But what he did was displeasing in the sight of Yahweh. So he took his life also. And then Judah said to his daughter-in-law Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up. For he thought, I'm afraid that he too may die like his brothers. So Tamar went and lived in her father's house. And when, when we start reading these first 11 verses, we realize that, that Judah is not at all an hero. Judah, the, the protagonist, the main character of this story, is actually more of a villain than an hero. In just these 11 verses, he did some pretty terrible things. And if you, you go back just one page in your Bible and read chapter 37, you see that this is just, it's just a consequence of what happened before. And the first truth that we learn from these verses is that sin, sin never stops. Sin never stops. Quickly, I want to show you from chapter 37 and these first verses what happened in Judah's life the moment it stepped into sin. This is the trajectory that, that followed him. In verses 18 and 20 of chapter 37, when Joseph comes and visits his brothers in the middle of a field, 
they start talking to one another. They start making fun of him. They call him a dreamer. And then in verse 20, they say, now then, come and let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And we will say, a wild beast devoured him. Then let us see what will become of his dreams. This is Judah and his brothers talking about Joseph, their brother. As you read this, this, these words, there's no, no hesitation. There's not even a discussion among, among the, the brothers. I mean, Judah is there, and he agrees to get rid of, of his brother like it was an animal, something that he could dispose of. But then you go ahead, and in verse 24, you, we read that they took Joseph, they throw him into a pit, and the pit was empty without any water in it. They are getting rid of their brother, putting him in a pit with no way that he could survive. And that's just the eight, the anger that grows into the hearts of Judah and his brothers. But then we see even closer an aspect of Judah himself that not only he was angry at his brothers, not only he was ready to commit homicide, but he was a greedy, greedy person. When we go down to verse 26, we see that Judah thought better than getting rid of Joseph, it is better to getting rid of him and making money while getting rid of him. What profit it is for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Hishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he's our brother, our own flesh, and his brothers listened to him. Now, he was not trying to protect his brother's life. He was trying to make money out of it. This is, this is who Judah is, a guy who is ready to betray his family for a small amount of money. And then when, when we continue to read, we, they get rid of, of Joseph. Joseph goes into Egypt. They go back home, and, and we see all the deception that Judah and his brothers put together. They, they bring this clothes, this tunic that Joseph had. They, they use some blood from one of the animals. They go to the father and say, please examine if this is true, truly Joseph's tunic, if these are his clothes. And then they sit next to him, trying to comfort him for the displeasure that they, that Judah himself caused. This is evil at, at its highest point. And then in chapter 38, we start reading that Judah did not care about his family. While his, his dad, his father was mourning and crying and he was desperate because of the loss of his child, Judah just left his family. He did not care about his family, did not care about his old dad, his old mom. He just departed, verse one of chapter 38, from his brothers and visited a certain Adulamite whose name was Ira. He just left. And you see how the little scene at the beginning, that anger that, they, that Judah had against his brother grew and grew. It became violence. It became greed. It became deceit. Sin never stops. Sin grows. When sin starts taking hold of your life, its power is irresistible. There's nothing that you can do to put an end, an end to it. And so we see this, this man, this Judah, who leaves his family and then does something that, that as we read the Bible, we understand how, how evil he is. He saw a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her and went into her. If you read, you don't have to go to Joshua to understand how evil was for an Israelite to marry to a, someone from the land of Canaan, to a Canaanite. You just need to read Genesis 1 through 37. In Genesis 9, the, the father of all Canaanites is 
is cursed by Noah for his evil deeds. In Genesis 24, Abraham sends his servant to his motherland because he didn't want Isaac to marry a Canaanite woman. When Ezo decided to marry a Canaanite woman, the Bible says that Isaac and Rebekah grieved in their heart. And when Jacob had to go and find a wife, he was sent to his motherland so that he would not intermarry with a Canaanite woman. But Judah here, he just go. He sees, he takes, he went into her. That's how this relationship is described. Not only he did something that was against the tradition of his family, but this, the way the interaction between Judah and his wife, we don't even know her name, uh, is described. It's just, it just shows the gravity of Judah's sin. He sees this woman as an object. Uh, in, uh, before smartphones came out, nobody used to take pictures of their food um, <laughs> and post it online. But, but because, because camera were expensive and, and, and having a film and having to go and print it, it was an expense and nobody, not, not everyone could afford that. But now with camera, everybody can do it. With a phone, everybody can do it. And in 1986, this change happened when, when the um, camera company, Fuji, put out the first disposable camera. That you can use it, print your stuff, and get rid of it. And this is what Judah is doing with this woman. He's seeing her as a disposable object. He saw her, he took her, he went to her, and it's done. She conceived, bore a son, and he named him Ter. She conceived again, bore a son, and named him Anan. She bore still another son, and named him Shela. All the interaction, years of marriage between this woman and Judah, and all the Bible has to say about it is this brief description. The only thinks that it's not worth noting is the interaction that they had in their bedroom. Nothing else, no relationship. It was an object to have an offspring, to have kids. And then in chapter six, we see how the sin continues in Judah's life. This sin, bad, bad husbanding, translates into bad parenting. Look at how evil these two sons, Er and Anan, are. And of course, Judah uh, is not responsible for the evil deeds that this guy did, but he was responsible for instructing them in the fear of the Lord. Um, this is what Proverbs over and over and over tells us. This is what is the responsibility of a father, of a mother, to train their kids to teach them what is good and what is evil. But these two, these two sons, they did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh. And their evil was not just some regular sin because if the way God acted, it was different than the way God normally acts when someone sinned. God stepped in and took their life. God took their life. He made them die. This is what the Hebrew text says. He made them die. If God would act like this for every sin that we commit, there would be no one on earth today. Everyone would be wiped out. So for God to step in in this way, to stop that evil, they did something really, really terrible. Especially Anan. Look at how he acts. Is instructed to provide for Tamar, this young woman who was left as a widow, no kids, no way to survive in that culture without having some children who would take care of her. And so Hanan's responsibility as a brother in law was to give her that descendants. And 
instead of doing that, it just wasted its seed on the ground not to give her an offspring to his brother. This is evil. This is against every law of their time, against any good practice, love towards your family. Where did they learn to act this way? Well, from his father, who did not care about his family, who left everyone behind, who left his father, his mother, who sold his brother. This is what sin does. Sin does not stop. When you concede once to sin, when you leave a foothold in your life to sin, sin grows and grows and grows like a cancer that contaminates and infects all the cells in your body so sin grows like mold that goes from one fruit to all the other fruits that are in the same basket so sin affects not only your life but the life of those around look at Judah that was his personal sin yet he went to impact his wife his kids Tamar's life and on top of this we see that Judah was a, a deceiver by nature verse 11 then Judah said to his daughter-in-law Tamar remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up wait for my next son to grow up and he will fulfill his duty towards you by what he was really doing it was it it was just taking time because he was afraid that Shalas too may die like his brothers. Instead of taking responsibility for his failure as a father, he blames Tamar, as if Tamar was the reason, the one guilty for the death of his two sons. So Tamar went and lived in her father's house. And as we close this first section, I just want to pause one moment because it would be easy for all of us, me included, to go and make a quick judgment on Judah and say Judah is an evil, depraved, wretched person. I would never, never do something like Judah did. But let me remind you what the Bible says about our own nature. Romans 3.10 says that there is none who is righteous. No, not one. Isaiah 64.6 tells us that we have all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. We might not go to the extent of Judah's sin, but we share with him the same sinful nature. The reality of sin in Judah's life is the same reality that we face. The Bible says that we are dead in our trespasses and sins, that we used to live according to the last of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind. Martin Lloyd Jones once said that the believer is no good man. No good man. He is a vile, wretched man who has been saved by the grace of God. We are just like Judah. I would dare to say that we are Judah. And if it wasn't, for God's grace, we will continue and do the same things that Judah did. But there's even another point that I want to remind you. As we read this story, this first 11 verses, God seems pretty absent. We see sin after sin in Judah's life, and, and God let him continue in his way. And there are just two brief, two brief descriptions of what 
the Lord did. He judged Judah's son, Er, and Anan. And we might continue our life in our sins thinking that we will not face the consequences of what we're doing. We might go and continue in our life. But let me remind you that God sees your life. God sees my life. God sees what you do in the privacy of your room, at your workplace, in your home, when you are all alone. God sees you. And God exercises judgment when he sees what you're doing. It might not be the same quick judgment that he executed on on, on an, an air, but nonetheless, one day, if not in this life, when we'll be before his throne, God will execute that judgment. And I don't know you, I don't know if how many of you are true believers and how many of you are here for the first time, but let me plead you with you. If you're not in Christ, if you're not placed your trust in him, run to him now. You don't want to fall in the hands of God. You don't want to face the judgment that he has reserved for you. It will be much more terrible than one Er and Anan experience in their life. It will be a judgment that will last for eternity. Go now, repent now, turn to Christ now. Because God sees what you're doing. God sees the sin in your life. And God one day will bring about his judgment. And so in this first 11 verses, we saw our first truth, that sin never stops. Sin grows and grows and grows until it takes complete hold on your life. The second truth that we learn in verses 12 to 23 is that man's effort cannot fix our sin's problem. Man's effort cannot fix our sin's problem. Verse 12 starts saying, Now, after a considerable time, Shua's daughter, the wife of Judah, died. Now imagine that you're sitting on your couch and you're watching a movie and, and you have this little young baby uh, that is born on the screen and then uh, another image of him playing with some toys and then walking and then going to school and then college, getting married and having kids and then growing old. And as all these images go through the screen, the narrator says, and the day passed and turned into months and the months turn into years, and years into decades. And so our young baby turned into an old man. This is kind of what Moses is doing with these words after a considerable time. He's saying, look, we left Tamar in his father's home, and Shelah, that is a young boy, but now time has passed. Maybe 15, maybe 20 years, we don't know how much. But, but there's an event. They shake and change things in Judah and Tamar's life. Judah's wife, and still we don't know her name, died. And when the time of mourning was ended, Judah went up to his sheep shearers at Timnah, and he and his friend Ira, the Adulamite. And it's interesting to notice the way Judah mourned over his dead wife. And compare that to how Jacob mourned over his lost son, Joseph. Look at this quick parallel. Judah's mourning is described with these words. And when the time of mourning was ended, that's, that's how it is described. In Hebrew, it's just two words. All those words, when the time of the mourning was ended, it's two words. Jacob mourning is described in two long verses, verses 34 and 35 of chapter 37. He tore his clothes, he put sackcloth on his loins, he mourned for his son many days. Then all his son and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. 
And he said, surely I will go down to Sheol in mourning for my son. So his father wept for him. Judah's mourning is no detail at all. Jacob's mourning is explained. Many details. His sackcloth, his clothes, the mourning, the interaction, his words. Judah is comforted. In Hebrew, that expression, when the time of mourning was ended, is literally, he comforted himself. While there was no comfort available for Jacob, for the dad of his son. Judah goes back to his work right away. But Jacob is devastated. His life is changed forever. Judah moves on. We, we will read later that he will go with a prostitute right after he finished mourning for his dead wife. But after many years, in chapters 42 of Genesis, years have passed, and Jacob is still mourning for, for his son, Joseph. We look at these two pictures, and we quickly realize that the one who comes out really not in high terms is Judah. That's not the way you mourn your wife. But that's who he is. Sin made him a hard man who did not even have time and tears for his own wife. Verse 13, he was told to Tamar, Behold, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. And, and we know, I mean, you guys live in a smaller town. People talk and rumors go around fairly easy. And this is what happened. Tamar was there, Judah was coming in the city, and someone told her, look, your father-in-law is coming to take care of his business, of his sheep. He's taking care of his sheep, but he still hasn't taken care of her daughter-in-law. And, and we see in this brief rumors that gets to Tamar's ears, we see the sovereign hand of God moving. This is not accident. It is no chance that someone went to her to tell her that Judah was here. This is God's hand at work to manifest his great grace in lives of sinners. Because let me tell you up front, Tamar is not the hero of the story. She's not better than Judah. She's as much of a sinner as Judah himself. Look at the deceit that she puts in place in verse 14. She removed her widow's garment, she covered herself with a veil, she wrapped herself, she sat in the getaway of Anaheim, which is on the road to Timna, for she saw that Shela had grown up and she had not been given to him as a wife. She's there looking at Judah coming back, seeing Shelah that now is a, is a man. He could fulfill his duty as a brother-in-law. And she decided to put up a ploy against, against Judah. She changed her appearance. She's ready to take advantage of, of Judah. When Judah saw her, he thought she was an Arlo for she had covered her face. Judah was unable to recognize who Tamar was. She disguised herself well enough that he did not recognize her. But there's also a lesson that we can learn. And the lesson is that sins blinds our judgment. Judah was so entrenched in his sinfulness that not only he went to a prostitute to satisfy himself, but he was not even able to recognize her daughter-in-law. Verse 16, so she turned aside to her 
So he turned aside to her by the, ro the road and said, Here now, let me come in to you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. And, and he goes right away. Uh, I mean, he's, this, this is a man driven by his own patient. He is as just one desire. He wants to follow, satisfy himself, follow his last. And he goes to Tamar, come with me. But she is, she has, she has a plan. She is not ready to give herself up so easily. She, she is like an expert businesswoman who's been there for, for years. And she said, yeah, I'm coming with you, but what will you give me that you may come into me? And he said, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, but will you give me a pledge until you send it? And you see, she's, she's acting smart in this context. Not to follow her example, not to deceive others, but, but she knows what she's doing. And look at the verb, give, 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 repeated several times. Verse 16, what will you give me? Verse 17, will you give me a pledge? Verse 18, what pledge shall I give you? There was something that was due to Tamar that Judah never gave to her. He never gave her the offspring that belonged to her. And now Tamar, instead of waiting on God to act on her behalf, she takes the initiative on herself and says, I will take by myself what is mine. And when she asks, she asks for a pledge, she knows exactly where she's going. Verse 18, give me your seal and your cord and your stuff that is in your hand. And a commentator said that these three objects represented the identity of Judah. In modern time, it would be as someone comes to you and asks you, okay, give me your wallet, give me your house keys, and give me your ID. And you would go give it to him. That's how much she asked for a pledge. And everyone in his right mind would know that there's no thing, no physical thing on earth that is valuable that you get rid of all your possession, your identity, who you are. But once again, sins blinds blind your, your judgment. And Judah is willing to give up what identify him just for a few hours of pleasure. So he gave them to her and he went into her and she conceived by him. Again, the way it's described is like just an object, uh, a business transaction. I give you something you give it to me, and then we leave. And the fact that she conceived by him at the first time that they had a relationship, it reminds us that, that God's providence was still at work. That even in the messiness of their sin, in the ugliness of what they were doing, God's grace was still reaching out to bring about something magnificent out of their sin. Verse 19, she arose, departed, removed her veil, and put on her widow's garment. The ploy is over. My disguise is done with. Tamar can go back to her normal life. And verse 20 to 23 really shows a, another really bizarre, weird way of Judah dealing with things. When Judah sent the young goat by his friends, the Adulamite, to receive the pledge from the woman's hand, he did not find her. He asked the man of her place, saying, where is the temple prostitute who was by the road at Anaheim? But they said, there has been no temple prostitute here. So he returned to Judah and said, I did not find her. 
And furthermore, the men of the place said, there has been no temple prostitute here. Then Judah said, let her keep them. Let her keep my, my seal, my cord, my stuff, everything that identifies him. Let her keep it. I don't care. Otherwise, we will become a laughing stock. My appearance is more important than who I really am in my identity. I can lose everything that represents me, but if I keep my face in front of others, that's good enough. That was good enough for Judah, at least. And his explanation is just nonsense. I mean, you're giving out everything that represents you. After all, I sent this young goat, but did not find her. So on my part, I did my part. I kept my hand of the bargain, of the agreement, but if I cannot find her, I cannot find her. And before we close and we move to the last few verses of these chapters, let me make a quick comment because it seems like Tamar did something awful and God did not do anything about it. And Moses didn't even care about making a comment on a negative comment on what Tamar did. So I don't want you to think that, that God is condoning this kind of behavior, that Tamar's attitude, behavior is, is okay. This is not what Moses is trying to do. Because first, not condemning does not mean that you're approving. When God does not condemn something, it's not implying that he's approving that. The Bible is a book. It's a living book. But when we are in these narrative passages, most of the time the narrator is just narrating. He's telling what's happening. He's not there to exercise a judgment on everything that is done, especially because both deceit, what Tamar did, and the sinful, incestuous relationship between Tamar and Judah are expressly condemned in other part of the Bible. Psalm 5.6 tells us that God aids the deceitful mouth. Leviticus 20.12 tells us that the kind of relationship that Tamar and Judah had is an abomination to the Lord. And it's enough that the Bible tells one thing, one time, to be true from Genesis to Revelation. God doesn't have to repeat a standard every page of the Bible. If he said it once, that's valid forever. And second, even if Moses did not condemn, and even if God did not judge Tamar for that sin, it seems actually that God is blessing Tamar's ploy. I mean, after all, she got what she wanted. She wanted an offspring. She put together this deceit, and she conceived. She got what she wanted. Is that a sign that God is blessing her? No. That's a sign that God's grace is greater than our sin. That's a sign that God's grace is not injured, but our wretchedness. That is a sign that when God wants to save sinner, there is no sin too big for him to forgive. God's grace is greater than our sin, greater than our stubbornness, greater than our pride, greater than our sinful ideas to get what we want. But as we arrive to verse 23 of this chapter, let's be reminded that nothing, none of these sins has still been resolved. Actually, the situation is even more messy. Tamar tried to fix things her own way, and instead of fixing things, she piled up more sin. If, if Judah's situation was horrible and Tamar's situation was terrible, now they both grab the shovel and keep digging in 
and, and bury themselves even more into the ground. There's nothing that they did in these 12 verses that improved their situation. They are as sinful, as wretched as they could be. Man's ploy, man's effort cannot bring us out of our sin. Tamar's ploy may have given her a son, an offspring, but did not solve the problem in her life and the sin, the greater problem that she had. And it definitely did not solve anything in Judah's life. And so, as we look at these three truths, the first one was that sin never stops. Sin grows and takes hold of your life if you don't keep a check on it. The second truth is that there's nothing that you can do with your own effort to save yourself. But this is where God's grace steps in. This is where the third truth is truly the glorious truth of this chapter. God's redemptive grace is able to transform the most sinful lives. God's redemptive grace is able to transform Judah, to transform Tamar, and to do a lot, a lot more. Look at what happened. Now, it was about three months later, maybe, maybe Tamar was four months pregnant, five months pregnant, and, and Judah was informed, look, your daughter-in-law Tamar has played the airlock. And behold, she's also with child by Elod. Then Judah said, okay, bring her out and let her be born. This is Judah's judgment. Bring her out and let her be born. Burn. This is a quick judgment for a man who committed the same very sin that Tamar is accused of. And in ancient time, in Israel's time, both the woman and the husband were equally guilty of adultery. And both deserve to be burned, to be stoned, to be judged. But, but Judah doesn't even care to wonder who this guy is. Who's the guy who, who, who went with Tamar and gave her a child? He only cares about getting rid of her. And Tamar could shout out and say to everyone, Judah, the, the man is you. Come with me to the stake. Let's burn together as a nice family, and everything will be done. No. They were dragging her to the stake. But she sent to her father-in-law saying, Look, you'll be the judge now. I've been with the man to whom this object belong. And she said, please examine and see whose signal ring and cord and staff are this. And these words, please examine and see whose signal ring and cords and staff are this, echoes back to Genesis 37. When Judah and his brothers went to Jacob and told him, please examine it to see whether it's your son tunic or not. Almost word for word. The same words that he used to deceive Jacob about Joseph's death now are used to reveal his sinfulness. And for the first time, for the first time in Judah's life, he was finally able to recognize something for its face value, for its true value. Verse 15, he was unable to recognize Tamar. Verse 18, he was unable to recognize that he was overpaying for that hour of pleasure with Tamar. But finally now, Judah recognized them and it's as God opened his eyes. He saw all his sinfulness in one moment. 
Judah recognized them and said, she is more righteous than I, in so much as I did not give her to, I did not give her to my son, Shelah. In one moment, Judah realized all his wrongdoings, all his sin, all the deceit, oh, sorry, all the deceit that he had placed in his life. And more than an endorsement on Tamar justice, this is an admission of guilt by Judah. I did wrong. I did not do what I was supposed to do. And we know that Judah changed because look at verse, the end of verse 26. What does the Bible says? He did not have relations with her again. This is true repentance because true repentance brings true change. This is what 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 says. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. The repentance that comes from God brings a change in your life. And this is what happened in Judah's life. He did not have relationship with her again. And the story of Judah really ends in verse 26. And the next time that we read about Judah in Genesis is just, he's a new man. Flip a few pages to chapter 43 of Genesis. This is what Judah does and and tells me tell me if this man described in chapter 43 is the same man that we saw in chapter 38 verses 3 and 4 they are in Egypt they just came back to Egypt sorry they're talking with 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 Jacob and Judah spoke to him however saying the man solemnly warned us you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you don't send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, you will not see my face unless your brother is with us. This is a man who finally understood who was in authority. This is a man who was respectful of the order that he had received. And then, if we go down and we read the story, we read that the Judah, verse 8, said, Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die. We as well as you and our little ones. This time, Judah is showing interest in others, is interested in saving the life of people. I myself will be shooting to him. You may hold me responsible for him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame before you forever. This is a man who's now willing to take responsibility for his action. He's a man who is willing to lay down his life for his brothers. This is not the same man that we met in chapter 38. Look at the end of this chapter. Um, sorry, look at chapter 44, verse 16. Judah, what can we say to my Lord? What can we speak? And how can we justify ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's slave, but we and the one in whose possession the cup has been found. Judah is ready to admit his guilt. Instead of running away, instead of deceiving and covering up, now he's a man who has changed, who is ready to pay the consequence of his sin. 
And this story of grace would be great, would be amazing if it ended in chapter 26, in verse 26. Would be a great story, and we should praise God for saving Judah. But there is more. Because in verses 27 to 30, this is where God's grace reaches a whole new level. It came about at the time that Tamar, she was giving birth, that behold, there were twins in her womb. Moreover, it took place while she was giving birth, one put out a hand, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, this one comes out first. But it came about as he drew back his hand, that behold, his brother came out. And then she said, what a breach you have made for yourself. So he was named Perez. And afterward, his brother came out, who had the scarlet thread on his head, and he was named Zerah. Tamar conceived twins. This was not just one child who would bring her offspring, would continue the name of the family, two child who could take care of her. But let me tell you, these twins that are born are the greatest news not for Tamar, but for us. The birth of Peretz and Zera is the greatest news that you could have this morning. Flip your Bible to Ruth, chapter 4. Hundreds, hundreds of years after these events, everybody in this story died. Now we are in the time of judges. Israel is in the promised land. There is a famine. And, and Ruth came back with his mother-in-law, Naomi, to Jerusalem. And God blessed Ruth with a, with a son from Boaz. And when the news of, of her pregnancy comes out, this is how the people... Blesses, Ruth. We are witness. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom build the house of Israel. And may you achieve wealth in, in Ephrathah and become famous in Bethlehem. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, whose Tamar bore to Judah, through the offspring which Yahweh will give you by this young woman. If a story like Tamar and Judah Efton in my family, I would be the first guy who tried to sweep it under the rug and not to make it come out anywhere. But this is not how God works. This used the sinful relationship between Tamar and Judah, this evil story to become a showcase of his grace. May, oops, may God, this, this, let me step back. May God make you like Tamar, like the house of parrots who came out of this incestuous relationship. May he bless your family like he bless them. But even greater than this, let's go to the New Testament because this would be nothing, would be mean nothing to us if we didn't have Matthew 1. Let me read you to you these verses, starting in verse 1. The record, the record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez was the father of Ezron. Ezron, the father of Ram. 
Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. And when you read those few words, when you read Perez, Zerah, by Tamar, you know what happened. But how great that God used this relationship, this sinful relationship to bring about his redemptive grace in Jesus Christ. If we did not have Zara and Paris, there would be no genealogy for Christ. But it is because of God's grace that now we can read this story and instead of being shocked by the sinfulness of it, we can be shocked by the grace of God who redeems sinners, who redeemed Judah, and who can redeem, who can redeem us, all of you. If Judah, with all his sinfulness and wretchedness and evil in his heart, was able to find grace before the Lord, everyone in this room is able to run to Christ in faith, to turn away from their sin and trust in Jesus for salvation, to be welcomed into God's family. The same grace that saved Judah, saved John Newton, can save you today. This is how John Newton described this grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm fine. I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. It was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. May this be the words of all of you, of everyone in this room. We may, we may all join John Newton in, in singing this song when we'll be at the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you because we are sinful. We are far from you. We could not do anything to save ourselves. But thank you because this story reminds us of the power of your grace, how you works out even in the midst of our sinfulness. You steps in to rescue us, to give us a new heart, to turn us away from our sins to Christ. I pray that today and for the rest of our life we may sing glories to you. We may recount to others about your grace that saves sinners. Help us never forget who we were before you saved us. Help us never forget how your grace transformed us. And help us proclaim this grace to every person in every nation. We pray these things in your name. Amen. <laughs>